Rusty, thank you for being on. So we were just having this conversation about AI and it taking over article writing, but I agree. I think a lot of the, the fear of AI is always like, it's going to take away everything, but anything that's like unique and that you do and that personal element, that's like what stays because it's very hard to replicate that. Yeah, I agree. I think that the AI can take like facts and things like that and, uh, you know, and, and even create, you know, that they could, they could probably scrape the first 1 million results of Google and then compile a decent article and stuff. But what they, what it can't do, and I don't think it's going to be able to do for a really, really long time is, um, create a personal story, like, like an actual, um, individual. So I think that thing that's going to differentiate us as content creators that, that's not artificial intelligence is our own background and story. So I think that's super important in writing. Well, like it's going to, it's going to become more important to stand out. Yeah. There's a, I'm reading a super intelligence. Have you ever heard of that book? I've heard of it, but I, I, I don't really know what it's about. Well, so I'm not that far in, but one of the concepts that I loved is he said, every time that we figure out uh, artificial intelligence that like originally they were like, once it masters chess, that means that it's the, like it's true AI. And then it did. And we're like, well, that's not really AI. And it's like every time that it masters something new, we're like, nah, that's not really, and it's not it yet. So it's right. very interesting to see that progression because it's like until it can do the, like, where we just do something like completely random and out of the blue, it's going to be very hard to replicate what we do. But thank you for being on the show. Um, I wanted to start a little bit with like Fitness Black Book, your beginnings and uh, like how you got into the scene, what the intentionality behind that was. Yeah. So I started on, I started online in about 2004, but I didn't really have a, a focus. I was very interested in fitness, but didn't really know how to, uh, you know, get my message out there. And at that time, I, in, two th in 1999, I saw Fight Club, and um, I had been running clothing stores for 10 years up until that point, or maybe not 10 years, like eight or nine years up until that point. And I'd also been lifting weights. And when I first started working out, I worked out with these guys that were kind of, they were steroided up guys. I wasn't using steroids, but they were. But so they kind of influenced me and I got kind of bulky and stuff, but I was on, but opposite to that, I was managing kind of nice clothing stores where uh, you couldn't really fit into the clothes if you were bulky. So I, I had to buy, I was managing a uh, structure and that's now Men's Express. That was my first clothing store that I managed. Okay. I did Abercrombie also. Um, but uh, I couldn't even wear those clothes. So I thought this is kind of stupid. Like if, if you can, you know, I mean, if you can't look good in clothing. So then I, um, figured out how to lose muscle on purpose um, on my own because you couldn't find out that information in magazines or <laughs> yeah or online, right? So no muscle um, and fitness. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, over a period of a few years, I wrote the outline for a book on how to how, how to do this, and I just didn't know how to get that information out there. And then in two thousand and six. Um, that's when, uh, WordPress kind of came on board. I think they started before that, but that's when it be kind of, kind of became a thing that people started to do. They started a blog with WordPress, right? So I started a blog in 2007 and I took the information from my outline for my book and then just would do uh, blog posts. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And so the funny thing was after about, I think it was month four or five, um, somebody on bodybuilding.com, uh, they, they had a huge forum at the time and this is before Facebook, right? So, um, this, everybody was on forums and bulletin boards and stuff. So, so there was 700,000 members on this forum. And one of the, the moderators said, look at this skinny little motherfucker, like talking trash <laughs> about bodybuilders and stuff. Um, you know, he doesn't even lift and all this. So, so I got negative press. And uh, my site got attacked big time because I was saying that, hey, you know, too much muscle is kind of cheesy, um, you know, because that's kind of <laughs> what I believe. Right. So yeah, um, seriously. Yeah. So like and, and but nobody was everybody was was all still into the hardcore bodybuilding at, at that point. And so the site got attacked and, and, and then people who were. Uh, who were on bodybuilding.com also had their own websites and their own forums 
And so there's a huge viral uh, attack kind of against my site. And, I, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. I got, um, I think, 1,500 comments on the first day that bodybuilding.com what? Uh, attacked my side and then it was then it trailed off I was getting 300 to 400 per day and I'd have to moderate because some of them were, were good comments I didn't want to like delete yeah. every comment but it was taking a couple hours a day and I was managing a suit store at the time and working 60 hour weeks and then oh and trying to write new blog posts and stuff and uh, and so my mentor at the time I'm just like dude I don't know if this is worth it I'm making like you know a hundred dollars a month for my blog <laughs> and uh, it's taken a lot of my time and, and, and it's to be frank, it's kind of, kind of depressing. You know, these people are attacked or attacking me and stuff. Right. I mean, it's like hang in there. Um, and then, so after about maybe four or five months, uh, you know, we had, I was getting no more negative comments, but what was cool about it was um, all of those different sites that were attacking me and forums and stuff they were all linking to articles on my site ah. and by month six, my, um, I had so many incoming links to my blog. People forgot about all that other stuff and whatever article I would write, I would rank like one, two or three in Google. That's awesome. Yeah. You, I know the, my, my biggest bragging rights is, is for the term fitness book. I was not like that. That's not a great term for buyer intent, but I ranked, uh -huh. I ranked ahead of Amazon for a fitness book. Right. So, really? Yeah. So, uh, they, you know, and then, then, then within the year, I think I was getting uh, like 20,000, 25,000 visitors a day from Google because of that. That's amazing. So you get attacked and I know I, <clears throat> I found fitness black book probably 2013. So like, kind of like the end, I right. think that was the end. That was the end. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course went back through the articles and there's some great articles, but it was so against status quo. And I think that's why it was working so well. Yeah. You know, and, and I wrote it at the time I was kind of in my early to mid thirties and I was doing most of that writing there or actually mid thirties. Um, and so like just, just for my, I was just writing it from my world world view, you know, like me and my friends were, you know, my friends are like a professionals and, you know, lawyers, mm -hmm. doctors, that sort of thing. And uh, I just wanted to write something that, that I would think that they would like. So that was my avatar for writing. It was my, my friends. That's good. And, yeah. Because of that, my reader base, all my subscribers and stuff, I get comments all the time. There's like psychologists, doctors, dentists, orthodontists. Um, it, it resonated with them. So it worked out. So then fitness black book ends and you had, you created visual impact right after, or maybe a year or gap, or was it right after that? Yes, it was almost like a two-year gap, really. I, I, I took a pause. I was just, I got distracted <laughs> with some stuff. And yeah. Selling on Amazon, and, you know, I got into the Bitcoin thing, and, uh, <laughs> and I, I even um, did, like, in 2016, 2015, 2016, I even did a little bit of... Um, those uh clickbait <laughs> style blog. yeah i got distracted right so i actually did pretty well with that but um but then it just wasn't fulfilling you know just totally just celebrity type stuff so so then visual impact gets created and i know now and we'll talk about this in a minute you're going the contrarian route to the paleo diet but what was the idea behind visual impact at the beginning Oh, when I, when I created visual impact. So the thing about fitness black book was, um, there was a lot of articles on there that were, um, just articles to get, to get my blog ranked. So I knew that people search for a lot of celebrity stuff, So there mm -hmm. was just a lot of like shallow content, like how Jessica Alba got a bubble, <laughs> butter, you know, that sort of stuff. So it was, I just thought like, uh, if my family read some of those posts or, or somebody I just met like, Oh, let me look at Rusty's blog. It's fitness black book. And it's about like Jessica Beals, but Jessica Alba's, but you know, <laughs> Taylor Lautner Newman said so that was, you know, in, in the early or the mid two thousands, right. Those were kind of all the, the search terms. It was kind of really stupid articles. Some of them mixed in with good stuff, but like a lot of stupid articles there. So when I created Fit, visual impact fitness, I just wanted to kind of wipe the slate slate clean at this point, I'm a good writer. At the beginning, I was all right, but, but now I think I'm a good writer, right? So, and I know how to, how to do web design and make the stuff look really clean. So I'm like, let me just create the nicest looking blog on mobile stuff that where every article is really good and that I'm proud of. 
And that was kind of the idea behind it. It was a similar sort of thing, but just nothing but good stuff. And I didn't want to water it down with any of the, you know, <laughs> celebrity totally. type stuff. Yeah. yeah, I feel like that's such an underrated thing. Because like nowadays, Google is just saturated with those the content that is written for that. Like, oh, how can I increase Google SEO traffic? Unless like, wow, this is an amazing topic that I really want to write about or something like that. I think this will blow people's minds. But of course, they're not searching it if it's like an aha moment. Well, Google, yeah, Google, what's tough about that is, is it, it is saturated. So like if people think like, um, people think like should, the, the, the fitness niche is saturated. Well, it's, it's really not. What it is, is there's just, there's tons of really mediocre content, but mm-hmm. there's Honestly, if, if you do a Google search for something, are you satisfied with the top 10 results? I'm typically not. So if that's the case, and if you're a new blogger or thinking of getting into a subject and you think that it's too late, it's not too late. There, there needs to be better stuff in Google. Yeah, I was listening to a podcast by Susan Wu. Um, she's more of the marketing side of stuff, but she was talking about like good copywriting is basically dead for most companies right now. Um, and if you can write well and you can articulate your thoughts, you definitely, you always have a place like books last thousands of years. There's a reason. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So now you went from fitness black book to visual impact, which is more about the real stuff and high quality content that you wanted to write about. And you're on the track of combating the paleo diet. So not necessarily combating it, but a contrarian viewpoint to it. What is this new diet that you're talking about and uh, the way that you're thinking about the approach to nutrition? So this is interesting. So I started when I, when I started Fitness Black Book in 2007, that's right when the like paleo and primal stuff was taking off. Um, and so I'm, I'm friends with a lot of the early people involved with paleo and primal. I mean, I was one of the first persons to have a guest blog post on, uh, you know, Mark Sison's blog, Mark. Oh yeah. Um, he, and then, so I posted on his, he's posted on mine. Like I know some of uh, the offshoots of that. Um, but what was interesting was I went to Austin with, uh, um, back then and, and recently too, and, uh, hung around tons of these paleo and primal, people and stuff. But what I was finding was um, some of the guys in their early to mid thirties were uh, like, I don't, I'm not going to name, name names, obviously um, had to take Cialis and things like that really? because, because of erectile dysfunction. Hmm. Because, so what happens is, uh, you know, a high fat diet, you'll be really careful with that. And, and the first signs of clogged arteries and things like that is, erectile dysfunction because those are small capillaries are some of the oh. smallest in the body and stuff. So that kind of worried me. <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, and I remember in the nineties and, and even late eighties um, that we would get lean doing the exact opposite and I had tons mm-hmm. of energy and stuff. And so that was always in the back of my mind. Um, but also during this time I met a um, Olympic strength and conditioning coach in Iceland and I met him like in 2009 or 2010 he would comment a lot on my blog and stuff and I became friends with him and kind of lost track and then a couple of years ago uh, I reconnected with him on Facebook um, and then last year at this time um, he posted a picture of himself and he was just shredded and he's like only That's a couple awesome. years only a couple years younger than me too right just insane so so he you know he had a ton of comments like dude what are you doing are you getting ready for a contest or something you know and then he does he's a competitive judo fighter too and he, he trains oh. for performance not even he's not even trying to look good he's just trying to make weight for judo right mm-hmm. and uh, what i found out is he, he's like well i just you know i don't eat fat like i like i keep it down just to the minimum your body needs which is 10 percent of, of daily calories and then i eat a high carb diet and he also did lower protein. And I had been experimenting with lower protein for a, for a few years now. Mm-hmm. And, and what's funny was like, I cut my protein in half of the, the recommended amount for, and I did it for like two years because I read something Brad Pilon wrote. Yeah, I was actually just talking to him about this uh, literally an hour ago. Oh, right on, man. 
Yeah. yeah so, so, so like the low protein thing, like, uh, cause they always say like, you know, you, you need like one gram per, you know, pound mm -hmm. of body weight or whatever. So I thought like, well, what if I just had a hundred grams of protein in a day and I didn't lose any muscle at all. And I'm like, oh, I think these people are lying to me. Right. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> then for two, two, yeah. For two years too. Right. And, and so then I cut it down to like 70 grams of protein, no muscle loss, no strength loss. So I don't know what that is, but I believe you have to have, do, you have to be training, I think resistance training is the key is what it comes down to. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, uh, so then Mark, you know, he's, he's eating high carb diet, low protein, low fat. So then I do more research into, um, you know, body fat and stuff. And I knew this for years, but, um, really your body has an extremely tough time converting carbs in, into, into body fat. It has to, you know, it, it has to transform the carbs into body fat, whereas fat doesn't have to transform at all. If you eat saturated fat, your body stores it as saturated fat in your, in your body. If you eat uh, omega-6, you know, fatty, you know, fatty oils and stuff like cooking oil, mm -hmm. that's the form that it gets stored in your body. When you burn it, it, it comes back out in that same form. Um, and there was a, a study where they, where they tried to, they, they took a bunch of people and they tried to make them fat with carbs. And these people had to eat 5,000 calories a day um, of, of almost nothing but carbs. And they could barely eat enough to even begin to, yeah. to, to, to turn carbs into fat. And that only happened after day six of eating as getting stuffed with bagels and just being like, you know, so, you know, their stomachs hurt so bad um, that they could hardly even do it. That is so then crazy. I, yeah. And so, and so, so really what it comes down to is, is you can lose, you know, it's, it's easy to lose fat if you're eating less than 10% fat or if you're eating over 65% fat, like the keto. So there's, there's two ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. If you're in the middle is, is where it is, is where it's not the best way to eat. So if you're eating like the standard American diet of like 30% fat and then protein and carbs and stuff, that's the area where the, where the bad stuff happens. Totally. And so all the blue zones and stuff in the world are basically around 10% or less. So Loma Linda, California is, is a blue zone. It's the only blue zone in, the, in North mm -hmm. America. And they, they're vegan and they eat under 10%. And then Okinawa, that's the same. Mm -hmm. um, so the longest living populations stay lean on the 10% or less. And then the other end of the spectrum, the 65% or more, um, that's keto. And, and we don't know how long these people are going to live because there hasn't that's really been a, there hasn't been a society who's done this. Yeah, there's, I know Jordan Peterson often talks about the long-term ramifications of different things that we're doing in this society and how like you have to have 40, 100, 200 years to actually know how it plays out. Yeah, we don't know, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a, it, it's a guess, you know, but, but what I do know is that there's people getting erectile dysfunction from this yeah. diet and uh and but the, these are guys who, that doesn't happen immediately but you know you're four or five i think people are going to be really like not very oh, yeah. pleased with what happened so um and i'm not saying that everybody's going to get erectile dysfunction that does keto and <laughs> like slamming it like you know that type of thing but when you eat less than 10 percent fats that's not going to happen i mean that's for sure not going to happen i mean it just, yeah. just won't so um yeah. Yeah, there was, <laughs> totally. And I mean, there's, there's a lot to be said about like one, it's the quality of food too. Like when you're going for more fat, I see people exactly what you were saying, reach for the omega threes, sixes, the stuff that does get stored so easily. And it's like toxic in a lot of cases, especially when heated. But when we do things that use the adrenal mechanism for energy, that's when that stuff starts to happen. And that's a lot of the keto stuff. You're just taxing those adrenals. And they're like, I don't know what to do anymore. Someone please help. Yeah. And I think for the short term, you know, I think for the short term, it's probably fine. If somebody is like listening to this and they're on keto diet, I don't want mm -hmm. them to panic. I just don't think that this is something somebody wants to do super long term. And even my diet, the diet I created with Mark, um, you know, like I'm not like, 
you know, I'm not like somebody, I'm not telling somebody that they're going to have to like join my diet, like, like a church <laughs> or like a, like a religion or a cult. I'm like, man, give it a try for six, six to 12 months and yeah. get lean. And then if you like the way this diet, you know, if you like eating this way, continue to do it. Otherwise, just come back to it when you need it. I'm not somebody who who is like, jo- you know, join us and have like a glazy look and, and, <laughs> and like, and like I'm part of a huge movement. That's that's not what this is about. Totally. Yeah, I think whenever you get that cult mentality, the group think that's when you're like, why are people even doing this diet? Like the goal is you have some sort of goal. Reach that goal and be a regular person. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's, well, that, and that's, well, that was one of the things about keto that I couldn't really get on board with too, is, is you can't, if you drink alcohol, you're out of ketosis. And so that was kind of like a, I'm a huge bear person, you know, I like to go to bear fests and bear gardens. And like, I like to have my, like a Manhattan, like when I go to a bar or, you know, things like that. So, um, our diet, you know, you can, you can have that stuff and obviously you can't go overboard, but it's, it's more, beer friendly <laughs> yeah, so. it's, like, it's like life friendly in a sense yeah exactly living fulfilled versus like i'm gonna live forever it's like but i lost all my friends and i'm not allowed to eat anything anymore <laughs> <laughs> for sure uh so your strategy right now I, I i'm gonna take this in a lot of directions but is pinterest which is interesting because i feel like most people have neglected pinterest it's like that child that's not talked to as much, but has a lot of valuable information, insights, and people on it. And it's like literally the visual search tool of the internet. Yeah. So that's, that's why I liked it. So the thing is, is that running a blog, you know, you have to write quality articles Mm -hmm. that that takes some time. And then there's a lot of things that have this behind the scenes that people don't really realize that, you know, you have the, you build your email list and then you drip out, emails to them and auto responder responder sequence. And then you have to create products and, uh, you know, answer emails and things like that. So I didn't want to go on to like Instagram or, you know, I I did a Facebook page that has like 30,000 likes, but I didn't really get too much traffic from that. Mm -hmm. So now the big thing's Instagram, right? Yeah. I didn't want to go on there and then have to post something and then have to deal with responses. Right you know, like, like comments and things. It can be crazy. Yeah. And say, even same with Twitter, you know, you get weird, like, I just don't want to deal with that. So so Pinterest, you put up an image that links to one of your blog posts and there's no comments. You're done. I mean, there is comments, but nobody uses them. Right. So it's like, Mm -hmm. you don't, you don't have to babysit it. Yeah. And so we started using it um, about a year and a half ago. I think is when I started and I got a pretty good course um, about a year ago on, on how to really master it. And uh, now it's by, by far our biggest source of traffic. I think we get anywhere from 7,000 to 10,000 visitors a day from Pinterest. So and then it's pretty hands off. Yeah. And that's fascinating. I mean, your images on there, one, they're spot on, but two, it totally is one of those, like when everybody's paying and competing on one thing, like, why don't you find the other thing everybody's on, but no one's doing it yet. Yeah. I mean, I, if I could, I'd go back to, I'd go back to my space. I like everything. <laughs> I like to do everything that people aren't paying attention to. So you guys fight each other over here. I'm, I'm going yeah. over here. <laughs> and then there's like 5,000 people on my space and you get them every single day to your site. And it's like, <laughs> this is enough. It's, you know, it's that mentality of quality over quantity as well. I agree. It's, I agree. You don't need them. Like, hundreds of thousands of people you need like the good people who like really want to view your content interact with who you are and like they actually add to the community versus take away and pinterest yeah exactly and pinterest the nice thing about it too is it's um it's the buyer demographic i mean it's Mm. like uh it's a millennial mom and her who's about 30 33 to like 50 a you know you know around kind of the age group um, it's probably, we get maybe 60% women and, and 40% men going to our pins and stuff, but it's, a, um, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a kind place. There's no trolls and stuff. It's not like when I go onto, um, Instagram or even Twitter is even worse. It's political. It yep. is nasty. It's, 
you know, Trump and somebody calling somebody else a libtard or, you know, like that. So it's like, it's a downer, right? Pinterest is nothing but like um, images that people save, things they want to come back to. So for fitness, it's, uh, they might save a pin on how to get good abs and, but not come back to it and read that pin until later on. So they're, they're kind of, um, it's, it's about their future. It's like, you know, where do I want to travel? Here's a pin of ballet or a pin of 10 best sandwiches to eat in Chicago. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's, it's just positive and goal oriented. And, and it's just, it's just a nice place. I, I dig it. I like that. I like that thinking. I, Twitter is the worst. The people on Twitter, what people will say and just like, it's ridiculous. Especially like you brought up Bitcoin. The cryptocurrency community on Twitter is like probably the worst in the world. These people are like, they all hate each other and they all think they're right. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I don't even want to, and then YouTube feels like junior high <laughs> level <laughs> comments and stuff. It's totally ridiculous. It's a, it's a very interesting, cause like if you're not attracting the right community or you accidentally get thrown into one of the wrong mm-hmm. ones, like they can be dominant, just like the bodybuilding.com forums were at the beginning. Right. Right. But so, okay. So you're on Pinterest. You've got an awesome uh, course about the opposite of paleo. We're going to call it the live, live free diet. Uh, <laughs> what's the name of it? Oh, high carb fat loss. High carb fat loss. Awesome. And so what have you been really interested in lately though? What have I been interested in lately? <laughs> like that, That's a good question, man. Uh, I wasn't expecting that. So, um, I, well, so this is kind of interesting. This is an interesting thing. So I became an ordained minister, uh, cause, cause I, cause, because, um, I'm friends with a guy that taught me how to, to do internet marketing. Like, or he's one of the guys that taught me, um, for, for years, like probably eight year, eight or nine years ago, he gave me a bunch of tips and kind of become friends with him. And so just out of the blue, he, well, he invites me to his wedding in Chicago, but then out of the view, he, out of the blue, he um, calls me and says, Rusty, I have this crazy idea. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, yeah, like, do you want to marry me and my wife? Do you want to be the, the one who does the ceremony? So <laughs> the past, like, so it's high pressure, right? So this guy, yeah. you know, he, he's going to have a really fancy wedding with a bunch of people. And I'm not like a big time public speaker. I've done like, you know, like I said, I manage clothing stores and stuff. So I've talked in front of like 60 or 70 people for a meeting, but I've never, never done a wedding. Right. So, so like over the past few weeks, I've just been studying like, you know, what what do we have to say? And we're trying to come up with a script. And uh, so my focus has kind of been on that and running my, my blog and stuff. So the interests are, how can I be a good ordained minister? Just kind of hilarious. Awesome. Yeah, I actually, I did a long time ago. I went on the internet and did that uh, to become an ordained minister as well. Just because I was like, you know, it'd be fun to just tell people or like when you're out at a bar and someone's like, oh, can you marry us? Or one of my friends is like, hey, he can marry you right now. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't learn anything past the nine clicks it took on one of those cheap websites that's like, become an ordained minister, order your certificate. And like, that's what you have to pay for. Yeah, exactly. But uh, that's awesome. Is it in Chicago? You said, yeah. So it's just on the outskirts of Chicago and, it, and it's really, it's, it's looks like it's going to be an awesome wedding. So they have like a, they rented a huge barn. So it's kind of like the, I don't know if you, it's not like a hipster wedding, but you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. kind of like that sort of thing. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, yeah. Let, let me know when you're in Chicago. Cause I'm there uh, a few times a month. I uh, spend a lot of time there. We definitely grab beer. Nice. So you you live close to there? Uh, I I'm between Michigan and Chicago right now. I'm thinking about getting a place in Chicago. Um, but yeah. Nice man. Yeah, I I like I like cities. So I, I if I lived near Chicago, I'd probably live in Chicago. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's uh Chicago is a great place. So I gotta ask you. There's a concept that I like to call higher leverage skills. You've definitely heard of higher leverage skills, but the way that I like to describe it is something that um, you can learn in any field or through anything, and it applies to most things. So, for instance, learning to breathe correctly helps you get better at most skills. Um, Learning to learn allows you to learn anything faster. And uh, it could be a mindset or a paradigm, but what do you think is like a higher leverage skill uh, specific to you that's really helped you with a lot of what you've done with Fitness Black Book, with uh, 
your visual impact fitness and just like more so with life, like something that's helped you a skill that can apply to most things? Um, I think that the skill that's helped me more than anything. Uh, so I discovered the skill in, in kind of a weird time in my life. So in the year 2000, I, uh, became unemployed because I was running a furniture store that got closed down. So in 2001, I wanted to try something different than, um, retail. So I became an executive recruiter mm. for, um, PhD level medicinal chemists. So people who work in big pharma companies and stuff. So the company I worked for was an upstart. Um, and they had, they had a bunch of contracts to fill, to fill jobs, but couldn't meet any of the high level scientists. So what they, so they, they just, so what they were trying to do was call into companies and talk to like a lead chemist somewhere and uh, they were getting nowhere. So I thought like, well, who else knows PhD level scientists? Um, well, the, the, and how can we get their contact information? Cause these, these guys were, couldn't get past the front desk, uh, you know, they, they couldn't get extensions to these high level scientists and stuff. Yeah. So what I thought was, well, heck, they all went to the university. So what I did was um, emailed people uh, at the university. And so, um, and I told my CEO I was going to do this. I'm like, hey, I'm just going to contact. And they go, oh, we've tried to do that. That doesn't work. The, the people at the university don't, uh, they're not going to respond to you. The professors are really busy and stuff. And so what I, so, and I, well, what email did you send them? So they sent them this super, super long email, right? Um, and it was really formal and stuff. So I, I'm like, well, that's not going to get a response. Mm -hmm. uh, like, let me try this. So in the subject line, I would put um, like, hey, or, you know, like um, a colleague told me to talk to you. And I wrote super short conversational email. Yeah. And I became, so the skill that I learned was that um, people like, conversational type of writing right so so i th they responded to me because i was typing the way that i talk so i, I think that my biggest skill and, and what I, which i've honed over the years is writing exactly the way somebody would speak and so there's kind of a, a comfort level to it totally um and so that's helped me with uh product sales with traffic with emails um and so that's why I, I, you know, I, I do, I don't really do videos or, yeah. or even podcasts except for like this one and a few others, but thank you for that. Oh yeah. No, no, no problem. But, um, but I love writing and I just, uh, and every time I write, I'm like, I feel like I'm getting closer to the way that I speak in words. And so I, I guess that that's my highest leverage skill is writing in a way where people feel like they kind of know me or they feel like they're talking to me kind of. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, I have to say your face, even just your Facebook posts, the quick ones, it's a hundred percent. The voice comes out. Like I know uh, many people who are friends with you on Facebook and like everybody feels like they know you based on just how you're writing, which is like awesome. Yeah. Thanks man. And then, then when I meet them in person, it, it's, it, it's very, it's natural. I've met a lot, a lot of people in person I, that I met over email or you know through my courses and stuff and it just and it's like oh they're, you're, they're exactly like i thought you would be i'm like oh cool man. That's, that's good. thank you <laughs> oh that's awesome so another thing that i always like to ask is uh what is something you're questioning right now so that could be life it could be uh, society politics the world but something that is you see it it's status quo people always talk about it but you're like i don't think it's really that way I quit. So the, I quit. So the older that I, uh, the older I get, the more I question any sort of self help guru sort of person. So mm -hmm. the reason why I, I get, the reason why I think like this is, um, you know, you, you'll, you'll, people will follow somebody and think that they're one way. And then you find out later on that that person really didn't know what they were, you know, they, they, they'll have some scandal or something. Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, even somebody like Tony Robbins, I'm not slamming him in particular, Mm -hmm. but, but what I'm saying is, is that, um, you know, take bits and chunks of advice from people, but nobody has it figured out they're, They just, they're just better at making it look like they have stuff figured out. So, um, I kind of think that people are, have to really find their own path and, and trust themselves because, you know, like somebody will look at Tony Robbins, right? They'll think like, Oh, this guy knows exactly 
you know, how to live this perfect life. And, and in comparison, I suck or I'm not even close to as um, dialed in as he is. So I think people need to trust their instincts and kind of be their own leader, sort of. I don't even know if that's the totally. way to describe it, but I, I just question any sort of, and even people that have like courses of how to make money online. And that's one thing that drives me nuts too. It's just like, I know that the, with this, what they're teaching is not right. Yeah. So if I know that, there's probably higher level teachings that are trying to, or marketing that's trying to reach me. And those people are probably not correct either. So I guess I'm just real skeptical of that sort of stuff, I guess. Totally. Because there's, I mean, it's the element of like, um, when people would always say, if you can't do teach and, uh, but even past that, I mean, our human error is like always thinking that, you know, seeing the surface level or the cover of the book versus like what's inside and then not internalizing ourselves and then comparing ourselves to someone who lived a completely different life, different upbringing, different everything. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think there's tons of frameworks that can work and stuff. And, and I'm not even saying that, that all that stuff is bad. I'm just saying, just um, be cautious when you take advice from people and, and use a tool like, like if maybe somebody does affirmations or something in the morning or, or, you know, says that they, you know, writes down what they're grateful for and give it a try, you know, and if, if that helps mm-hmm. you, that's great. But then it maybe after a while it doesn't and you move on to something else. It, it, there's just not, there's not one way to be successful. Um, exactly. Yeah. People think there's just a certain route and, and that you have to like copy the way this guy does it. And that's not the case. No. And even like, so with the gratitude journal or something like that, it helps you for you. It's not helping you because of someone else. Exactly. It's just a skill that you can now use whenever you need it. Right. Right. Uh, so is there any books, any objects, technology tools that you've been obsessed with lately? So I'm, I'm going to reread the war, war of art by yes. Stephen Press, Stephen Pressfield. That's probably my all time favorite book. And then book number two, which I'm going to reread because what I've decided to is what I used to do is um, read a different book. Oh, you know, read different books and yeah. stuff. So, so now my, my whole idea is why don't I just find like the five best books that have really helped me. And I kind of just want to loop them over and over mm-hmm. and actually master them. Right. Yeah. Kind of like the Bruce Lee thing says he's, he's not afraid of the man that knows a thousand kick or 10,000 kicks, but it, it's more afraid of the man that's practiced the same kick one 10,000 times. Yeah. Something yep. like that. Right. Yeah. So that book. And then, um, uh, Lynchpin by Seth Godin are my two favorite books. I'm going to read that one next. Awesome. Yeah. I'm doing that right now with uh, anti-fragile. Uh, I've not read that. You have. It. Okay. So I know you may not want to add books to your queue. No, I can add another in the rotation. Book number uh, so Nassim Nicholas Talib uh, created fools by random fooled by randomness, black swan, um, anti-fragile and skin in the game. And they all kind of like complement each other. I think anti-fragile is the best one because the mindset of it, is uh things that gain from disorder and he goes through everything in uh kind of our life that we miss that like a black swan event is all these things that added up that we never saw coming or uh the fact that like doctors often mistake evidence of absence of something not being there for absence of evidence um it's a very good book for like different mental paradigms and thinking nice but yeah, that's one of my, that's, uh, I'm, I'm rereading that right now because I like to do the same thing. I have a bunch of books and I'm like, oh, I got to get through. And like, I do that, but I know that it's way more powerful when I can like actually get the messages out of these books. Cause it takes more than one passage. It's like the reason that studying in college or school sucks so much because you're like, I have to keep going over it over and over again. Yeah, exactly. Your mind like can wander at a certain point when you read it the first time and the second time it's more dialed in, <laughs> like, you know, that sort of thing. So yeah, I agree. Exactly. So Rusty, where can people find you? Uh, visualimpactfitness.com is probably the best. Awesome. And then on Pinterest as well, Visual Impact Fitness? Yeah, if they were to uh, enter that into the search bar, but I think it's, it's pinterest.com slash Rusty more is the... Awesome. The name. Awesome. Cause it, yeah, because at the time I didn't know that 
I should have used my <laughs> business name because it was only a personal account that I turned into a business account. But I think I have something like that similar as well. I don't know. Pinterest was like one of those things that I was like, I got to figure out how this works. And then I never did, but I still do stuff with it. It's, it's really spectacular. Like the people that I, that I'm learning from just get ridiculous traffic on there. Like I think, uh, you know, a few hundred thousand a month. So that's awesome. That is awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast. I know you don't normally do podcasts, but uh, it's just a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, the insights were awesome. Yeah, you too, Austin. You bet. Thank you so much, man.